And, this conference uh, will now be recorded. Sorry about that, Marion. Go ahead. No problem. The second uh, bullet point says uh, evaluation is one of the activities that grantees will need to commit to. And then moving on to project narrative, um, you can see that you know evaluation is in your application its its own section. So even though it is mentioned as um, you know the title of one of the sections, I'll have to say once I dig into the next couple of slides, you'll see that it affects three different sections in your proposal from project impact all the way to capacity. So first, in the project impact section, evaluation is correlated with the project impact, as you can see you know, in this statement. And evaluation has two roles. So in uh, the evaluation section, it says that one is um, evaluation, the first goal is to determine if intervention proposed achieved outcomes. And the second, out, um, the second goal is to document lessons learned. So I'll have to tell you that I think ACO is one of the federal agencies that um, doesn't only focus on outcomes, but um, they also really focus on the process in addition to outcomes. So lessons learned is the process part, which I think is very important, um, but not all federal agencies you know, um, emphasize on that. And then moving on to the capacity section, evaluation is mentioned twice in the capacity section. Evaluation should be carried out by someone or a team with the capacity, and they should conduct the proposed evaluation activities. And if we move on to the application review information section, you'll see that the total score um, that the reviewers will be giving is 100. And even though you know you see that you know evaluation seems to only um, you know, occupy for the 10% of, of the whole application. But it really is not so, because if you read the, app, the announcement more closely, you will see that evaluation is um, impacting approach, project impact, evaluation itself, capacity, and the budget section. So if you think about it that way, really evaluation can um, constitute up to like 90 points um, of your proposal. Okay, so looking at each of the sections that mentioned evaluation, so under the approach section, um, what, what, what does, um, so who does what needs to be clear in your approach section? And remember that it weighs 40% of your proposal, so that includes what the evaluators are going to do. And then in the evaluation section, um, there are some of the things that evaluation sections should address. Um, so I'm going to go through these couple of bullet points very quickly, including the first one, does the project evaluation plan reflect a thoughtful approach that would uh, measure the proposed outcomes? And then the second one is to take a look at, you know, which methods you're going to be using, qualitative or quantitative methods in measuring outcomes. Last but not least, like we mentioned, ACO really emphasizes in documenting lessons learned. So lessons learned is part of the evaluation process. Okay, capacity. So um, in this section, um, evaluation is mentioned a couple of times as well. So the personnel should have the capacity in um, carrying out the proposal, especially the proposed evaluation activities. Last but not least, there's uh, evaluation is also mentioned in the budget narrative and justification section. So this tells us that, you know, um, a you know, if you have an evaluation team during the time of um, putting together the proposal, um, it would be much easier for reviewers to evaluate whether those people have the qualification and capacity to carry out the activities. And, um, you know, hopefully if you do have an evaluator, that would give you better scores in terms of your whole proposal, as long as the evaluator or the evaluation team fit into um, the whole proposal and the project that you're proposing. Okie doke. So um, summarizing from everything that we just looked at, um, first of all, you need to draft an evaluation section, whether you have an evaluator or an evaluation team or not, you have to do that. Um, and then you have to identify in the proposal what are the evaluation activities, um, preferably, I guess, you know, having an evaluator or an evaluation team identified would help. And then the third bullet point talked about building evaluation goals in other sections because you know whatever you're going to do in your evaluation activities it would impact your pro, um, project impact capacity and budget sections 
Last but not least, just also, you know, want to stress again, ACL's commitment in working with you and your evaluation team. Um, ACL really takes that process seriously. All right, and our next chat question, based on your experience or perception, when you hear the word evaluation, what do you think of? And you can type your answer in the chat box. So we'll give folks a minute to think about that a little bit and type their responses in. So based on your experience or perception, what is your impression of quote unquote evaluation? And you can just type that in the chat box. And again, you can access the chat box in the upper right hand corner of GoToWebinar. It looks like uh, one person says program improvement. Another says reviewing the overall impact of the project. Another says quality review of outcomes slash measurements. Uh, monitoring quality. Somebody else mentions quality again. Evaluating how well your objectives were met. Um, a review of the project and then overview of outcomes. So a lot of um, the, the word outcomes pops up quite a bit. That's right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Because I think that's in line with um, what the um, announcement, the well, ACL announcement is talking about. So let me kind of my from my personal experience and my personal point of view, um, some of the reasons that I think evaluation is important. So I wouldn't go into kind of all the details about how to conduct evaluation because I think for all of you, um, the goal is to find someone to help you carry out those activities. So I will also in the end talk a little bit about how do you find that person? What are you know good evaluators? What are some of the qualities and characteristics? Why do we evaluate? Um, so from my personal point of view, it's all about funding. Um, the bottom line is, how do we get more funding to adult protective services? So that it, it really is the idea is that ACO, is, they, they need information to advocate for APS, um, especially on you know, the funding part. And also APS, we would like to get funding from the federal government as well, right? Now that we have this um, APS enhancement grant, we want that to keep going. But without any kind of information or data, it is really hard to make the case that APS is important. APS is making differences in people's lives. Um, you know, like one or two anecdotes, stories, those are always good. But when it comes to the policy level of making uh, federal decisions, they wanted to see what's the impact, you know, aggregated information. What's the impact of um, APS on all the clients that we're talking about? So the way that I look at evaluation is once you have your goal, um, we wanted to look at what's working well, right? So some of you mentioned outcomes. So what's working well so that we can replicate the program, we can scale up the program. And in the end, if we want to scale up and replicate the program that's successful, we need more money, right? So what we're doing right now, if it's working well, we document that so we can ask for money to do the good work. Nonetheless, a few of you also mentioned quality improvement. So that's aligned with what AP, ACO is really, you know, kind of they care about um, the lessons learned. So not everything is going to work well. So what happens is don't be afraid of what's not working well, because when it comes to what's not working well, we can identify how we want to improve the program, how we want to, you know, make it better so that clients would have better outcomes. Um, so in that case, like the argument that I would make is that if there are things that are not working well, we identify them and we ask for more money in order to do a good work. So this is kind of how I envision um, the relationship between ACL and APS looks like. It really is the goal is to use data to show what's working and what's not working so we can receive immediate feedback. And that's really important, uh, which you know I'll talk a little bit about in the next slide. Immediate feedback on how APS works. An evaluation should not be regarded as a pass or fail test. No, it's, a, it's an opportunity. It's an investment for future dollars. So you might wonder, well, um, if it is so important to gather data and, you know, do analysis and, you know, this sounds like this is research, why don't we just have researchers do it, right? I'll, I'll just continue with my daily work and um, I'll leave the job of convincing the policymakers to uh, APS needs more money. Oh, we'll have, you know, researchers do that. They can do whatever sophisticated stuff that they have to do. However, this is a graphic showing how long it takes for research 
to reach the change of practice that is coming from implementation science. Um, and the length that they said, you know, how long it takes, they said it takes about 17 years to, for research from the, the inception of, you know, this is a research idea that's worth exploring all the way to the change in practice. And what's not on this graphic is the funding, right? So once the change of practice happens, then hopefully there will be additional funding that comes after. I don't think we can wait 15, 20 years um, to, you know, have APS get additional funding. I mean, currently we don't have dedicated federal funding. How do we try to get that? How do we try to get there? Um, really, I think what we need to do is we need to start gathering data through the evaluation process, um, get feedback to the federal government as soon as, soon as possible so that we can establish that argument that APS needs and also deserve additional dollars. All right, and the last chat question is, um, do you have any QA or QI process in your program? And that's related to the next couple of um, slides that I'm gonna mention. We have a couple of responses already that people say yes, they do. Um, another says yes. Uh, um, let's see, another one. So far, they're all yeses. Mm -hmm. um, we probably had six or seven responses thus far, and everyone says yes. So, there you Great. go. Great. Okay. Um, so, that's related to what I'm going to be talking about. So, thinking of evaluation, um, you know, QA, QI, they aim to understand whether people are doing what they're what they say they're going to be doing and if, if they're not doing what they say they're going to be doing then how can we support people to do what they should do right so evaluation is very similar um so as evaluators i would say you know we're checking to see if people um do what they say they would do if yes wonderful and hopefully the output and outcomes are also what's expected too however if not that is okay because maybe the process needs to be adjusted and that, that's kind of how I see evaluation. Um, so if the outcomes are not what you expected, uh, this is not a time to say, you know, oh, you're doing a bad job. It's not a time to put blame on people. However, I think it's an opportunity to find out why it's not working as um, we expect it to. So for example, should training be scheduled for staff? Do we need more money to get to people um, to do what they need to do? So this goes back to um, conducting evaluation to advocate for additional dollar. You can probably see like the, the theme that I'm trying to hammer into your, into your brain is we do all these because there's this benefit that comes later. Um, and when you're um, working on your project and thinking about your evaluation, um, what I would like to encourage you to think about is to consider your story. So thinking about how to make other people care about what you care about right so this is um it, it's a it's a little bit like going submitting your grant proposal right so it, it a lot of you you know you have your expertise in your area most of you in APS when you write your proposal it is um you know um thinking about like this this topic and and you know in the most recent call it would be opioa substance abuse issues like oh it is very important and it's you know a big issue in my county in my state but how do you tell that story how do you make your readers excited it's the same with evaluation so using your qa qi experience um evaluation also starts with planning and we're doing it whatever activity we said we're going to do and we check if we're doing it and we act on it a little bit more so um what i would say is that we should um, consider evaluation as a continuing process, so a continuous process, I should say, instead of a one-time assessment. So think about things listed on this slide, including, first of all, what are you trying to accomplish? What's the goal of this evaluation? Um, consider what kind of data that needs to be collected to tell your story. Should it be qualitative data? Should it be focus group interview? Or should it be quantitative data? Should it be some kind of numbers that can tell the overall picture, overall story of all the clients that you serve? How many clients do you serve? How are they doing before? However, you know, however, uh, APS um, case workers or investigators reach out to them. And where, where are they afterwards, right? Maybe a month later, three months later, a year later. Um, and most importantly, 
who's going to conduct all those activities? Maybe that's going to be your evaluator, but maybe your caseworkers, investigators can take on some of the responsibilities in order to collect some of the data. Um, and also, why are you going to, um, how do you use data to connect it back to, you know, whatever goal that you're going to be um, achieving? And the last bullet point, so that would be outcomes, the third bullet point. And the last bullet point is about sustainability. I believe in the ACL announcement, the sustainability issue is kind of implied, if not explicitly discussed, um, with all the opportunities of the grants, um, usually, you know, two years to three years, uh, what resources do you need to keep up the good work, right? So after the grant, um, after your activities in the grant proposals end, assuming that you're doing a fabulous job, the clients are getting help and everything like that, what's, what's next, um, you know, um, two or three years later? How do you sustain the program? All righty, now a couple of the tips that I put together um, in terms of, you know, finding your evaluators and also um, working with an evaluator on some of the activities. So first of all, um, what, um, what are you evaluating affects who you find as evaluators? So what that means is obviously if you have internal program specialists who can serve as evaluators, great. If you have to go out and find somebody, what do you have to think about? Um, Going back to the goals of your proposal, what are you trying to achieve? What kind of data are you going to collect? If it's um, you know, um, qualitative information, is it quantitative information that you're trying to collect so that when you're interviewing um, or selecting your evaluator or your evaluation team, then you can ask about their experiences in previous research methods. Are they familiar with quantitative data analysis, qualitative data analysis, or if you have a big, you know, administrative data set, are they familiar with handling big data sets? Um, additionally, um, who, if you have stakeholders working with you, so not just APS, but other community partners working with you, reaching out to them and ask them if they know anyone who might be potential candidates for evaluators is another way to go about it. Um, and I think, you know, Ken Conrad would mention a little bit later that if um, you are interested in getting connected with potential evaluators as evaluators ourselves, we would be happy to, you know, also connect you with our colleagues who might be interested in taking on projects. Okay, and then um, what can evaluators do in addition to, obviously, they have to promise and commit to um, carrying out the evaluation activities in the proposal, but a few things to also kind of think about is um, if you already have a logic model, great. But if you don't, I believe as an APS grantee, um, part of the process during your project um, timeline is that you also have to develop a logic model. So um, qualified evaluators or an evaluation team, they should have the capacity to help you develop that logic model. So help you think through all the steps um, in, in your project and help you identify the differences between output and outcomes, for example. Um, and also, hopefully you have a um, good relationship with your evaluators or the evaluation team, because like I mentioned, I don't really consider evaluation as like a one-time deal where you do it and it's done. Um, hopefully it's a continuous process and thinking about the sustainability part of your project, how do you continue seeking funding um, after the two year, the three year of your ACL grant? So from my point of view, if you have a good relationship with your evaluator evaluation team, they could assist you with future funding opportunities, especially if they have grant, um, grant writing capacities, right? So they can help you draft the next grant. They can help you identify the goals of the next grant. Okay. Continuing with the tips of um, working with evaluators, and this is my last slide before we go into our Q&A. Um, remember, um, you're the expert in APS, or you know, if you're coming from um, a different area, you're the expert in your area. You don't have to be the expert of everything. That, that's why we work together, right? I mean, my expertise is in doing research, conducting evaluation. Um, but since you are the expert in APS, 
um, you can definitely tell the evaluators what you are looking for in the grant. Right? So this is one of the things I think a good evaluator should be good listeners. They should know what you are looking for in your project because it's your project, right? You're the one who gets the funding. Um, but then you tell your evaluators what you're looking for. Um, for example, if you wanna establish um, clear goals, establish a logic model, um, and you provide your evaluators as much information as possible so that you can help to bring them on board relatively quickly. Some of them may not have any experience with APS. Um, some of them might do, but even if they do, they may not have the experience of working in your county, in your state. Um, and I know that you know APS programs in every county, every state, um, there's always differences, right, in, in policies and in guidelines. If you are fortunate, so that's the second bullet point, if you are fortunate to have someone internally um, working with you, could be you know the, the evaluator themselves but if that program specialist um, is, is not the evaluator and you're working with someone outside that program specialist can be a real asset so um, my example would be like you know when I work with San Francisco APS they have a program specialist and that person knows the languages you know in the data side of things but they also know the languages in the program APS program side of things so they can really be that bridge of bringing in your evaluator and help them be on board relatively quickly um, obviously not all responsibilities are on you so I would also say that good evaluators I mean hopefully they would they know something about APS even if they don't they should strive to understand your program if they come in and they start telling you this is what you have to do a b c and d and not listening to you there's a little bit of a problem there um, um my personal expectation is you know a good evaluator should listen to um what the program is looking for i mean but the bottom line is this is your aps enhancement grant right so they should be helping you they should be listening so that being said the last bullet point Communication really is key. Um, eventually, the goal is for you and your evaluators who speak really the same languages. When I say the same languages, this is, um, it might be a little bit hard to understand, but you know, when you say A, the evaluator should be hearing A. He or she should not be hearing A plus or A minus because A plus and A minus, that's not A. They should be, when you say apple, they should be hearing apple. When you say granny apple, they should be hearing granny apple. Communication is key. Um, so having continuous conversation and foster a culture of um, asking questions is really important. Okay, so now we're moving into the Q&A session um, of our presentation hour. And um, this is what I really love about this presentation. So we have, um, two invited speakers in this session. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is that um, we will have them um, talk about the five questions that I that, that I thought of. Um, so we'll post those five questions one after the other, but also at the same time, if you have any questions you want to ask them about or ask me about, please also go ahead and put it in the chat box. Um, anytime is okay. So whatever questions that you have, you can go ahead and start putting them in. Um, and I will um, do my best to monitor the chat box um, so we can bring all the questions that you have before the hour ends. Okay, so we have um, two speakers that we invited to come to our Q&A session. Um, Michael Hagenlock is the APS Bureau Chief of Montana, and Michael is an ACL APS Enhancement Grantee veteran, I would say, because um, uh, Montana APS under his leadership has already gotten two um, ACL APS Enhancement Awards. And our second speaker that we invited represents um, this very experienced evaluator, Dr. Ken Conrad from University of Illinois at Chicago. So um, Ken have, have worked with um, Illinois APS, San Francisco APS, Napa APS, Montana APS, and a bunch of you know, other nonprofits too. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start with the first question from Michael and Ken. Could you please both briefly introduce yourself? 
Yes, thank you, Marian. Uh, my name is Michael Hagenlock, and I am the Bureau Chief of the Montana Adult Protective Services Program. We are a state-operated program. Uh, just to give you a little idea about Montana, we're the fourth largest state in the country in landmass, but we're also a state that only has about a million people here. Uh, we're primarily a rural state with some frontier counties. Uh, Montana APS, we face many challenges like most of you with funding, grant writing, and of course making things work with the vast challenges that we run into in travel time. Uh, just getting from one case to the other sometimes can take us two or three hours just to go see somebody um, to do our uh, interviews for abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Uh, when making recommendations for services and ensuring that their services are available to the individuals, that can be challenging. It's one thing for us to take two or three hours, but now to try to get the uh, uh, client, if you will, or the individual um, that needs services, how do we get them to services if they're not in their community? Um, here in Montana, we've been successful in obtaining two grants, as mentioned, one in 2016 and then again in 2018. And I'm happy to participate in this session to hopefully be able to articulate the importance of APS working with evaluators and how they can help with your programs and understanding the outcomes of the programs and to help build with your, your programs with these grants that may be available to you. So thank you and appreciate everyone being here. Ken? All right, yes. <laughs> I was waiting for Marion to, to, to ask for me. Um, my name is Ken Conrad, and um, I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Illinois at Chicago, so that means uh, I'm kind of semi-retired. It means I'm pretty old. So I've done a lot of stuff, you know, like especially in uh, evaluation. Um, so, you know, I've published in evaluation journals like uh, New Directions for Program Evaluation, Evaluation Review, Evaluation in the Health Professions, Evaluation and Program Planning. So there's my credential in evaluation, which is important for you to know about. And um, I've done a lot in measurement. And so when we study new things, you know, it's important for us to have measures of outcomes, for example. And, uh, uh, so I taught measurements, uh, mental measurements, uh, as a professor at UIC. And um, one of the products that we developed is called the Elder Abuse Decision Support System. So it's an entire system for measuring elder abuse, which is used now in a different, it was developed in Illinois, and uh, it now is used in San Francisco, Napa, and Montana under the, a new rubric called the Identification Services and Outcomes Matrix. And uh, Marion is the principal investigator on that uh, grant proposal. And, um, you know, and I've, it, you know, you want to look for evaluators who have some experience doing research and some experience in writing grants. And uh, I've written a lot of grants and have brought in a lot of research money. So between like 15, 20 million dollars. So, you know, so we've, we've got some pretend credentials in that area as well. Fantastic. Yeah, um, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. So the next question is, how did you get started working with, so for Michael, evaluators and for Ken, um, you know, APS under the ACL APS Enhancement Grant? Yeah, so from an APS perspective and myself here in Montana, when I first heard about the evaluators, um, I didn't really think much beyond our own program evaluation. You know, when I heard the term, it's like, okay, so we're looking at the SWOT analysis or something like that of our program and what's going on. Um, <laughs> and, and understand that we all may have some really great ideas. We think we've got the whole idea of what we need to do. What I've learned and understood with the having a good evaluator is really learning to how to either prove or disprove these theories that we have. Um, we were successful in obtaining our first grant and, and I was talking with other colleagues at the NAP NAPSIS conference. Um, I came to realize as much passion as we had and the great people that we had working around, um, I also realized that uh, we all felt like we knew the answers and, and we knew where we're headed. Um, but 
the problem I would have is how do I really prove that theory? How do I really substantiate that and tell our story as you were talking about earlier? So I realized I needed more and even more important a neutral person. Um, somebody could really not only learn what we do, but like from a researcher evaluator is to give this that honest feedback. Uh, what is the data really telling us? You know, it's much like uh, when we work with our individuals out there, we can see problems and what might work for them, but that's from our experience. And so you can become a little bit blinded by that. And by having an evaluator in there, it really helps you see the full picture and somebody who's neutral and not coming from our same chair to really help us learn and understand. And as we process this through, we were able to become even more, uh, I don't want to say compliant, but uh, you, effective with the NAMRS reporting system, the National Adult Maltreating Reporting System. Uh, we were part of the pilot project when that came out, and it's like, okay, well, as we started looking at it, it's like, wow, we're missing some components here. We're missing some pieces here. And when you get the evaluators involved, then you start learning what you can do better and how to use those numbers that are coming out and not just numbers. So this led me, you know, after working uh, through the NAPSA conference, whatnot, where I met uh, Marion and Ken, and uh, talking with them and better understanding and listening to you folks as well at a couple of the conferences, it helped me understand better what we needed to do. And so um, that's how we became working with the evaluators is just learning and listening to our colleagues and realizing that we need to get that next piece in there so we can bring it up to the next level. So we really can answer not only what we want to do, but was our grant successful and did we meet our goals? So that, that's how we got started in it. Ken, what about your experience working with APS? Well, um, yeah, this has uh, been a, uh, you know, one of the highlights of my career working with APS, uh, which I've been doing probably for close to 15 years now uh, with my wonderful colleague, Mickey Iris. Maybe some of you knew Mickey. Unfortunately, she passed away last year. And, uh, but, uh, you know, now I have a wonderful new colleague in Marion who was also working with Mickey. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, an interesting thing is the example of Montana, in, which Michael, you know, started sharing with you. And we came on board while Montana already had obtained the ACL grant. And so we uh, worked to help to um, evaluate the success that Montana was having in achieving their goals. And uh, you know, so in that in that in that way, you know, we kind of uh, kind of sit back and and observe and you know take some measurements and uh, learn about learn about Montana, you know, and how well they're doing and do the do the best we can because we weren't involved in in developing the proposal and that sort of thing. Now another example is we currently have a grant here in Chicago with the Legal Aid Society of Metropolitan Family Services, the largest social service agency in uh, the county, Cook County. And uh, you know, we were in on the ground floor on that one. And uh, so we were able to help them write their, develop their logic model. We were able to help them you know, develop their uh, measurement strategy you know, to a great extent. Not, not as, as much as maybe we would like to, because you, you know, as I think Marion was hinting, you know, evaluators can't be too hands on either. We've got to listen to, to the uh, client. We've got to observe, not be, not be pushy, but listen and, uh, and meet their needs, you know, as the evaluator. But what that developed into then is because we're interested in Adult Protective Services, and this is Legal Aid Society. They have, they, they have as an affiliate of Metropolitan Families, the Umbrella Agency, an APS, a big APS agency serving Chicago. And so the connection with APS and Legal Aid Society led us to develop a um, financial forensic center. And that's 
what we were interested in. We have a background in financial exploitation, and we wrote a grant with them. As the evaluators, we now took our experience working with them and turned that into a grant from the National Institute of Justice, which we were successful in getting for a million dollars, and we're working on that grant now also. So this, this gives you an idea of how working with, a, with an evaluator who's especially interested in your area can be very productive. And you talk about sustainability. I mean, look at the sustainability that Legal Aid Society is going to have now. Look at the prominence, because we publish in these areas, you know, that they are going to have. They will come, they will be able to show this as their experience when they ask for future funding. Well, Michael is, is a pretty special guy, and uh, he, uh, he sees this stuff. And sure enough, he got us uh, working on his next grant proposal, and we now have a grant under review with ACL uh, for a million dollars, and uh, we are keeping our fingers crossed. Maybe I'm jinxing us. I hope not. <laughs> Knocking on wood. But anyway, this, but this is a sort of a, uh, a model that you can think about. You know, do you want to get an evaluator, you know, from this circle of researchers in adult protective services, someone who will really be interested in you because you also are interested and you are interested in moving your ideas forward and you are interested in being uh, sustainable. I'll stop there. All right. So moving on to the third question, um, <clears throat> what have been the benefits of working together so far? Well, you know, one of the, the biggest benefits of working together is much what I just mentioned and what we're talking about here is from my perspective as an APS staff member, if you will, the investigations, all the things that we do and learn, you know, we have our uh, guidelines for how to operate adult protective service and all that. Those are all good. Um, from the evaluator perspective, what do they know and where's their expertise? And to bring those two things together is, for me, that's huge. That's a big benefit here, because uh, it helps us expand our understanding of what we're doing and how to tell our story. And the more I even learned, and this is what's really helped us move forward, is getting a better understanding between the rural and the metropolitan areas. What are some of the similarities and the differences? Um, you know, we were talking here a while back with a group, and, you know, they're talking about, you know, whether it's in California or New York, all the different areas, um, and the problems that they're having and the barriers they're running into. And I'm sitting here in Montana going, we have the same issues. They're on a different scale in some ways, but at the end of the day, they're really some of the same issues. And so the benefit is to really learn and understand that, hey, we're all in this together. Um, it, it's not just a state issue somewhere else, and we all kind of get locked into, well, but in our state, it's this way. We, you know, Well, in reality, is it's there in a lot of the states. And, and again, this is why doing this research, bringing these evaluators in, helps me learn what is going on in other states as you heard Marion and, and Ken both talk about the other areas that they've worked in though they can bring that knowledge with the with them and tell us about those stories and then we certainly understand that wow we have those same issues oh my gosh you know we can open our, our eyes to it and so working together we we better understand the effectiveness of our program we understand both the uh, particular applications as well as the research and the impact it will have on us um, some of the lessons learned in our capacity and what the research is actually telling us we need to or should focus on to help improve our process to assist the individuals we're working with. It really helps us and the biggest benefit again is helping us tell our story to the stakeholders, not just within you know, adult protective services in our group, but the management level above, the director's office, the governor's office, the legislators, and as we're finding, we use the same information. We're out in the community and sharing the information with them, what we've learned. And, you know, some people say, well, gee, you've changed on what you guys are doing. You're right, we have, and here's why. So we're able to tell our story and back the story up at the same time. So that, that's what I find is the benefits of us working together.
Fantastic. Well, what do you think, Ken? Well, you know, we're researchers, we're evaluators, um, and uh, what that means to me is, uh, you know, we're learners. I mean, basically, we are learning, and the great advantage of working with Montana, San Francisco, Napa, uh, my state, Illinois, Marion State, now Indiana, and other places is that they invite us in so that we can learn from them. And believe me, you know, we can't do good research if we can't learn from people in the field. You know, we learn by talking to them. We learn. I've always been hands-on. I was studying nursing homes for a while. I went and booked myself into the nursing home. I stayed in the nursing home for a couple of nights in a wheelchair, you know. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, so always hands-on, get out into the field, uh, and, uh, you know, I went, went out into the field on some cases to see what APS caseworkers do, what their experiences are. And uh, so a huge advantage, benefit to me, is that I get to uh, learn more. And, uh, and um, you know, I think a, a, big, a big benefit that we, I didn't mention before, too, to writing the grants is that researchers, most of them, have a pretty good appreciation for measurement. Remember I told you that I taught measurement? You know, I mean, you can't really manage things if you can't measure them, you know? And science is all based fundamentally in the ability to measure stuff, you know? So uh, we uh, uh, can help, or evaluators can help you to figure out whether, and Michael said this in his first comments, you know, that these scientists, these researchers can help you to understand in an objective way, using obje objective measurement, whether you have achieved your goals. So, um, you know, and, and uh, that is something we have done working with people in the field, is we have helped to develop these measures in adult protective services, and hopefully, you know, that'll make a, a, a good contribution. And that's what that's what we're all about. We're trying to make uh, a good contribution. Great. Now that we've talked about the good, what about the bad? What about the challenges of working together? Michael? Yeah. Um, part of working through this process, the challenges are going to come up. You know, we've kind of briefly mentioned them, you know, and, and it is about learning each other's language. Um, I'm not a researcher. That's not my strength. Um, and so the, some of the terminology and the way things are looked at are different than the way I'm looking at it. So I have to learn uh, their language. The same with the evaluator is to learn our language. Well, as most of the folks out there know, you know, you can go from state to state and even within APS, we have some different languages that we use. And so to learn and understand, like here in the state of Montana now, we say it's indicated versus substantiated. And just that little word alone can sometimes throw some folks off. What does that really mean? So those become the challenges. And that's why it's really important to find folks that have an invested interest in this uh, field that we're doing. And your evaluators have to have that same passion that we all have in the field so they can learn and understand. Um, as I said earlier, we're a rural state. You know, our largest city, like I said, is about 100,000 in Montana. Uh, we were talking about that before we came on, you know, about the size of our areas. And, you know, so we have the challenges, like most of you, of, you know, where our services were, things are at, but it, it might be the challenge of finding evaluators. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough, you know, through the, the conference whatnot at NAPSA to meet Ken and Marion and, and learn better and what I needed to do. Um, I looked within my own state, and we are a rural state. Um, and so then you start looking, are there evaluators right here in the state of Montana? Some have asked me that. Why are we not working with our own universities here? Um, there's some very good people there, and we got some excellent uh, colleges. And yeah, I'll give a shout out to Montana State University, or Bobcats. They're a great school. But when I talked to them, they were more interested in well, do you have any of the grant money? What kind of money can we make on it rather than the subject matter? That told me right away that's not what we want. Um, <clears throat> they, they'll learn. And now some of them are starting to hear what we're doing, and so they're starting to call us. 
but so I think that's the challenge is finding the evaluators that truly have a passion for the work that we're doing and much like both Marion and Ken had pointed out is to listen and learn about our program and what we're trying to do and work together so transferring these lessons learned you know whether it's in a rural state like Montana, a very uh, populated one like New York or California or any of those others, it's finding the right people to help you walk through it and you all are on the same goal and the same mission. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Ken, any thoughts about challenges of working together? Sure. Um, you know, so, um, Michael started talking about uh, the money, you know, and how perhaps the Bobcats are a little too interested in just just the money. And uh, obviously, you see that we're very serious about uh, adult protective services. I've been working in the area for 15 years. Marion's been working in the area for 10 years. And, um, you know, we uh, really want to, to make an impact. So that's, that's, that's very important. But it's also important for us that the uh, the recipient of the, the grant, you know, and that, that is Michael and Adult Protective Services Montana, that they're serious about it. And uh, I don't, and I and they are these these Montana is. Uh, I think maybe the best example I've seen though is San Francisco. I've I've never seen any any uh, group as dedicated to uh you know continuing improvement so we are just about wrapping up the acl grant but they have started a new initiative at our behest because we are interested in it and we think it's important and we told them this is what's important and uh and they have initiated and are doing uh, under their own auspices without external funding, you know, this research. That's, that's sustainability. So, uh, you know, so anyway, maybe that's not a, you know, a negative thing, but, but if, you, if you, on the other hand, let me, let me tell you this. I have had the experience where I was the evaluator and I wrote significant parts of the grant, including logic model, for an agency that, we got the money, we got the million dollars. I'm not gonna say who these agencies are, who the funder was or who got the money, but once we got into it, we saw they weren't really interested in doing a high quality work. So we, and, uh, we said, we can't go on with this. <laughs> and we had, to, we had to withdraw. And you know, they had to find another evaluator, which, you know, it's not, that hard, you know. There's in this, I think in this grant there was like it was a million dollar grant, so there was two hundred thousand dollars, twenty percent for evaluation. They could, they could pick somebody up. You say, are you out of your mind that you didn't uh, keep the two hundred dollars and just you know do it anyway? And but we saw what was down the road, and it was not going to be pleasant. It was not going to be good. And so those are that's an example of a negative experience. Uh, and but we're, we see also with Montana that they are talking about how are we going to extend this? Oh, we can't do it now. Listen, we're going to find money in the budget next year. We'll do it. That's the way they're talking. All right. So we have about four minutes. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, just see if you have any final advice for uh, the fellow APS grantees. Um, and um, if anyone has any questions, I think it would be a good time to start typing into the chat box too. Michael? Yeah, oh, yeah so uh, to sum it up really quick, you know, from practical advice, right? Um, keep an open mind and look at the data, the facts that are coming in. I practice being solution focused. How do we resolve the identified problems? and build the relationships and continue with the future grants. Look ahead, what can we do? Don't look at it as a barrier and a roadblock, but what are the solutions that we need to come up with to move forward and, and get the right teams put together? Ken? Oh, um, final advice. Let's see. 
Well, I think, um, you know, just to wrap it up, it's important to get the evaluators involved early. It's important to get uh, evaluators who are interested in your topic. There are quite a few researchers now in adult protective services, a lot of good young researchers. Uh, they may not, as Michael pointed out, may not be from your local university, from your state even. But, you know, the important thing, to see, you know, you see how important it is that they be interested in the topic. And, but it's also important that they be patient and that they not, you know, not have an axe to grind. You know, say, this is what's important. You know, they have to listen to you. You know, you, you know your state. You know, you know what is important to you. And they have to be willing to listen and get on board with that. So, um, anyway, that's, uh, and, and the sustainability issue. You know, I think being really sincerely dedicated to what you're doing you know, that uh, that shows up and, and it goes a long way. And then you want to be looking toward future projects. And good evaluators will be doing that, too. Well, Ken, I just want to add one more thing. I remember during our discussion with Michael, at one point you talked about serious evaluators. They want to make your APS program the model program of the country. That's kind of, you know, when they're serious, you know that they're passionate um, about, you know, this project, right? Right, right. And that's uh, that's what we intend to do. And uh, sure enough, at the last NAPSA conference, San Francisco won an award for, I think, the best APS uh, around the country. And uh, Marion won an award, too, as uh, <laughs> for service to, uh, to, to NAPSA. So, hey, you know, Sometimes if you do good stuff, you know, it gets noticed. So, so that's, uh, that's a good thing, too. Fantastic. So uh, to wrap up, I wanted to kind of make sure that um, we also know there are additional resources out there. So today's presentation, we kept it fairly, you know, simple. Hopefully we convinced you that evaluation, I think, you know, at the very beginning during the chat, when we we're doing the chat box, one of the uh, impression of evaluation is monitored, which I was like, ooh, wow, okay, that's a strong word. Um, hopefully we convinced you that there's a value in um, doing evaluation and there's benefits, although I understand that, you know, people could get anxious or, you know, there might be some fear even involved when it comes to evaluation. Hopefully we convince you that there's good in it. Um, if you are interested in getting to know more about how to get your agency ready to do evaluation, um, our NAFSA Research Committee back in 2013 um, hosted this webinar, um, and it's um, you know by Ken and I's colleague, Dr. Mickey Iris, who um, passed away, but this is her legacy for sure. So in this 90-minute webinar, she walked through like step by step how to get your agency uh, ready for evaluation. So if you're interested, check it out. All right. Um, Andy, do we have any questions? I know that we're at four o'clock Eastern time right now. Um, I believe Michael, Ken, and I were all available to stay on a little bit uh, more. So um, go ahead. Sure. sure. Um, it looks like we do have one question, uh, but just as a reminder to the attendees, you can type your question in the chat box, or um, if there's you know a pause in the conversation, you can unmute yourself and just ask via audio. Um, either one works great for us. So the question that we have so far is. Um, Dr. Conrad mentioned recognizing high quality work in the grantees. What are some examples of high quality work from the grantee you as the evaluator recognize? And again, I'll read that one more time. Dr. Conrad mentioned recognizing high quality work in grantees. What are some examples of high quality work uh, from the grantees that you've recognized as an evaluator? Can you wanna go ahead? Yeah. Well, I think uh, you know, um, you know, we can talk about Montana. Uh, that um, you know, we are very interested in documenting what they do, and uh, as part of the current ACL project, we are you know tracking and measuring things. And one of the things that uh, is, is very important to us and turns out very became very important to Montana as well was tracking services. 
you know, so what are the services that APS delivers, what referrals do they make, and how well are those uh, services delivered, those, ref those are services that are referred for, uh, and what are the outcomes? And uh, so they just jumped on that. Uh, Michael has four service regions in Montana. He enlisted a caseworker from each of those four regions. Uh, they, we, uh, they have been using our system, the ISO matrix, uh, since, uh, was it February or March? And so they have a, a log of cases. And uh, so we did a random selection of 100 cases in each region. And in two weeks, those uh, caseworkers that Michael has uh, recruited for this uh, will be reviewing those cases, will be calling the clients, will be calling uh, collaterals, friend, friends and family, if the client is not able to answer, and the service providers, if need be, to track these things. What are the services? that APS has delivered, what are services that the agencies, referral agencies delivered, and what are the outcomes. And we have an outcomes assessment that they use uh, to, uh, we have a, you know, a system to determine outcomes. And if new referrals come up, you may open new cases, things like that. So um, that is, I think, a great example of something that they're applying in their current ACL grant uh, which is going to give, give great strength and, and, and information to ACL. Uh, it also is, a, is the topic, actually, uh, part of the topic of the grant that I said we wrote with them that is currently being reviewed by ACL. And uh, in any case, uh, from what I hear, Michael is committed you know, to moving forward on this, improving the ISO matrix, because this is an area of development that we're doing. And um, anyway, maybe long-winded answer, but <laughs> I think that's a pretty good example of, man, you can't, you can't ask for better commitment. And, uh, you know, um, what was the word you used? <laughs> you know, uh, to, um, you know, to uh, uh, dedication from, from an agency to the, uh, to, to the work and, and the improvement. Mm -hmm. Of, uh, of adult protective services. Well, if I may also add to, you know, um, kind of Ken, what you're talking about, um, I think, um, I guess, Michael, just to put you under the spotlight, I guess, <laughs> uh, would you also talk a little bit about kind of your um, plans and efforts in terms of reaching out to policymakers and advocate for funding? I mean, I feel like my, 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 my message has been kind of, you know, this is going to be beneficial because we can ask for more funding. And I know that you have that plan in your mind. Yeah, absolutely. And that's been one of the beauties of, of working through this, you know, um, working with these grants and through ACL and, and the uh, logic model, putting all this together and then bringing the evaluators on really helped us propel this into telling our story. And so we were able then to take this information and I took it up the ladder, you know, to my boss, the administrator, and then to the director of the Department of Public Health and Human Services and said, hey, look, you know, here, here are our numbers. So between the work that we've done here and combine that now with the National Adult Report, report, uh, report System, we were able to put these numbers together and, and show really what's going on in Montana in comparison with other areas around the country and that we are on track and these are the good things that are happening and as well these are the potential risks that we're facing if we don't make changes now uh, we can see what the data is showing us and telling us in the future for the number of elderly all these different cases and here in montana we work not only with the elderly and we stay with the age 60 and older based on the older american act but we also work with individuals who are, have some form of disability that are age 8, 50, or 18 to 59 and so when we were able to put all that in and use all this information from the evaluators and members and all that, we were able to go to the state and said, look, we're, we're in a problem spot here if we don't make a change. So with that, we were able to 
put the information for it. And, and as Ken mentioned, you know, I, I was able to pull some folks from a different region. Um, that was kind of a, a forced issue in that we needed to do this for other reasons as well, to track the number of guardians that we have out there, the number of uh, service plans that are being developed by our investigators. We needed people to be able to monitor these things appropriately. Well, my bosses bought into it. And when I was able to show the data and the information, they immediately started working on it. And before we even get to our legislation, which doesn't start till January, they already approached me and said, hey, we found four F or two FTEs within the uh, Department of Public Health and Human Services. Would that help you? That's the beauty of it is we didn't have to go create more budget and find more funding. They had it in other areas within the very large Department of Public Health and Human Services and brought it to us based on this information. Uh, I hope that answers your question, the, the positive of it and how that story can help you out. Exactly. Perfect. Um, Andy, do we have additional questions? We have another question, yes. Um, if you did not initially budget budget in for an outside evaluation, how do you recommend we best seek out an external evaluator? So it's a tricky one, I'll repeat it. If you did not initially budget outside evaluation costs, how do you recommend we best seek out an external evaluator? That is an interesting question. Can Michael, um, any thoughts you want to jump in? Absolutely. Um, so any of you that have the grants, uh, especially with ACL, um, I would tell you to go to your uh, grant advisor. Um, mine is Omar. And you, when you recognize these situation going, oh gosh, we didn't think about that. We need to add this. Call and talk to them there's a really good chance that they'll be able to work with you and again for you to tell their story that how this is going to help you and then you can do an amendment to the grant and they can tell you the steps that you can take you know every grant is a little bit different and what the rules are and, and that's why the a acl grant advisor there uh is so helpful to help you learn what you can and can't do. And most of the time, those folks are all, everyone I've worked with, Hillary, Omar, I mean, just, and I know I'm leaving some folks out there that they've been wonderful to work with. And we told them what we want to do and here's the steps we want to take. And they said, great, give me a amendment to your budget, to your budget narrative, where that's going to fit in, how you're going to do that. And that's what we did. And, and it really helped out. So I would suggest talking with uh, your grant advisor on these ACL grants. Ken, do you have any thoughts to add? No, I just uh, want to uh, reinforce uh, Michael's uh, good advice there. I have nothing to add. Well, so um, if I can add something else, I think um, it might also be um, useful to try to reach out and um, if there's an, any opportunity to get in touch with like junior researchers or scholars, that might also be an opportunity too. Um, I'm just speaking of experience. So when I first graduated from my PhD program, um, I was a broke, um, like I don't, I didn't have a job. <laughs> I was looking for opportunities. Um, and Lori Littlegrammaticus, I think most of you know her as NAPSA's executive um, director, but she was California's APS liaison at the time. Um, so she heard about me being interested in doing elder abuse research, and she said, well, I have some projects, but I have to tell you, I don't have any funding. And I know that this doesn't work for everyone, um, but to me, that was an opportunity that I'm willing to take on. I'm willing to risk my um, kind of financial stability at the time. Um, by taking out opportunities and i told her that i would write grant proposals i would try to you know bring that finance piece to support myself um and that's you know the start of my career in working with california adult protective services and that led to additional funding down the road so i guess what i'm trying to say is it's great to seek out experienced evaluators but if there are um young scholars who are interested in the field um and you know, if it works out, give them the opportunity because, you know, for me, it became my career. Great. Any other questions, Andy? There was just one other just comment about somebody was curious about the costs. Um, any any estimates that this is something they just shared? They were curious about the cost of 
of external evaluation. I'm sure it varies quite a bit, but I didn't know if uh, any of you had anything to say about that. Can um, any rule of thumb, any advice that you might be able to give the audience? Well, yeah, I think uh, we usually look for about 20% <clears throat> of the direct costs, 20% of the budget. Um, and then, you know, we just make it fit, what it, whatever it is. And, we're, you know, we're pretty motivated. You know, we work pretty hard on, on things, um, you know. And uh, people are usually pretty satisfied, get their money's worth. So we, we hope Michael will be as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and exactly and, and to answer that because there there is no pat answer that it's five percent ten fifteen or twenty percent every issue every situation is a little bit different because even when we initially started it you know we were set that as the previous question asked gee if you didn't allocate for it how do you do this well that's when i went to the uh to our folks there at ACL and said, hey, we need to make some adjustments here. Here's what we're doing. They're like, yeah, you're good. Go ahead and do it. Well, of course, I get hold of the evaluators and I say, here's how much I have. <laughs> and this is as far as I can go with that. And, and these two folks here um, didn't really hesitate at all. They just said, okay, let's look at what the scope of the project is and see what we can do. And we worked out an agreement. You know, and then we move forward with the next one. You know, there's a, a different standard, of course, set to that. So everyone's a little different. And I think Marion and Ken both hit it. And what I said earlier, solution focus. Don't look at that as a barrier. Find the solution because they're out there. And even if you can't hire, you know, the, the Marions and the Kens of the world out there, you might find that person that wants to get into this field. And they can be helped with by other individuals as well of what to do. So solution focused and, and uh, be, be willing to spread your wings. Fantastic. Yeah, there, there are a lot of researchers out there who are looking for a place to do research. You know, so, um, you know, Marion has, has put her uh, email on here and um, so you should uh, contact her, and uh, she can probably put you in touch with somebody really good. She, um, I think she's she's more connected than I am at this point, so she's the best best person to talk to about that. Um, and uh, but but it's really true, you know. People, if 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 you hit them, hit the right person, you know, that's going to be the most valuable connection. And if you hit it off with that person. Uh, that could, uh, you know, help your program develop for years to come. Absolutely. Yeah, feel free to email me. I'm happy to help make connections depending on the project um, that you're working on. And um, I can, we can brainstorm a little bit about, you know, who out there might be um, the best fit for the project. Andy, Great. anything else? Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions right now. I want to make sure I give um, folks a chance to unmute themselves if they want to. You're welcome to um, ask a question via audio if you want to. Now would be a good time to do that if you have any questions you'd like to ask that route. Well, oh. I am not seeing anybody unmuting themselves just yet. Yeah. So, well, um, um, as Michael also put his email in the chat box, if you have any questions, you know, let us know. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us, you know, on a Friday afternoon um, and hope everyone have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Could you go to the next slide, Marion? Please. Oh, yes. There we go. Okay. We want to thank everyone for attending, and please know, again, this webinar was recorded and will be uh, placed online at the APS TARC website in the, few, in the next couple of weeks. And if you have any other questions or anything related to this presentation, please feel free to reach out to the TARC at the link on this slide. Thank you very much, and everyone have a good weekend. Thank you so much. Oh, and thank Bye -bye. you to our presenters very much. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, no, I say that. Thank you.
Bye.